And the idea is that you're using this against various match statistics to systematically nudge. There's a demand supply, not very good, 56% match. We do something, 62% match. We do something else, 81% match. This is the lighthouse building. Well, we know the match is going to be good if we deploy technologies in this way against demands deployed in that way. So we know in advance that that's going to be good. The devil's in the detail, of course, which we'll get to in a minute. It's also possible in tools like this to invoke real-time demand management. So you're doing load management, like shifting things about in time as per rules, which are rules of viability. We can turn the heating system off, but only for so long because it's a lightweight building, or only for so long because it's a heavyweight building and it'll take us too long to recover. But we can turn it off with minimum impact. And what this will do is start to play about with demand side management interventions to facilitate better match scoring. Once we've got to this stage, we know what's happening in our city or institution. We know what the possible potential matches are. We can now move down to what is the most rigorous way we can look at problems, which is the, the real virtual reality of, in this case, building design. And the important thing here is this statement, which you have to turn your head 90 degrees to understand, and that is uh, you make increasing effort and you get increasing reward. And the more you go down towards here, the more you have to bring in a multidisciplinary approach. But what you're doing is prototyping and testing across every dimension of performance in a dynamic manner, the, the building or the built environment, the community, whatever it is you're modeling, uh, in a way which makes it very robust when you deploy in practice. So I won't dwell on every one of these, but just quickly, this is a scenario of what might happen. You might visit an energy modeling system. There are many examples that, that ESP is an example of. There's many other programs. Um, and these are just taken from one system. You visit the system and immediately you're given a reward because there's online databases of past projects. Um, there's online uh, databases of embodied energy and, and other things. So you get a reward, but you haven't done very much. That's what the second uh, picture there says. You consult online resources and you learn a little. Then you might start using your CAD uh, program interface to develop the geometry, the geometrical specification. You don't need to start there, you could jump down here, but let's say we start there and we put the geometry in, as, a, as an architect might do. The very first thing you get is a reward, you get a false coloured, um, um, visually uh, impacting image. So you can have a discussion with the client, that's Victoria Key in Edinburgh. And you might be talking here about, we're planning this atrium for daylight utilisation. Now that image is based purely on geometry with false colours, there's no other information but it's sufficient to have a very rich dialogue, energy dialogue in this case, uh, at a very early stage in design. If we now start attributing the model, saying, well, this wall is made of that, this window is made of that, this floor is this, then we can start to get a reward like embodied energy. If you make the wall like that, then you'll have this embodied energy in your project. If we then care to go on and select a boundary condition, temperature, radiation, here's some different sky types we've selected. We want a uh, an overcast sky or a clear sky. If the model now says, wait a minute, I've got geometry and I've got construction, which means I've got surface finish and I've now got a sky type, I can go off now and I can prepare uh, images like this, which is to do with glare. So it's actually for a school in France and they wanted to put light shelves in, so the light shelf is in the model. And now we can begin to look in and see oh, if you see these numbers, oh, that's not very good, there's bad glare there, I really should go back and change the, ge the geometry or change the reflective or the angle of the light shelf. Go back to it, see that sorts it. In this example, it's quite possible to call up an internal illuminance distribution map. That's raw energy there for the taking. So if someone cared to spend a little time defining a photocell, that's all that is, sensor, response, and an actuator, maybe make it a photo cell, I want to uh, sense the illuminance and the working plane, and I want to then switch the electric lights, I want to dim them or whatever. Then we can start to see the displacement of electrical, light, uh, electrical power, red, with daylight. And that's a significant saving of high grade, high carbon impact electricity. 
At this stage, we say, let's check out whether we can use natural ventilation. So all these little nodes and arcs, someone has to know about leakage distribution, pressure distribution, some agent needs to know in order that we can set up a model of the leakage flows. Some number crunching takes place and we say, well, we can go so far with natural ventilation. We really can do quite well, but we can't completely solve the problem. So let's go and now look at an HVAC plant. But the HVAC plant is um, a hybrid. It's very downsized. So it's very energy efficient because we're going to use natural ventilation where and when we can. At this stage, someone says, what about renewables? So we now add in special material response, like photovoltaics. We'll generate power from the fabric of the building. And we can see how that might work. Someone says, well, what happens about the distribution of thermal comfort? So now we've got to be in feeding the, 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 the information required to do the more detailed air movement analysis which needs to be invoked suddenly within the computational environment. Some agent says, oh, I now have sufficient information that I can invoke my computational fluid dynamics engine that's fully integrated with everything else. And now you start to see what might happen, thermal comfort, what might happen if a fire starts, a safety issue. So this is just to remind me to say everything's inter interconnected. As we're feeding in systems they are going in, as we're feeding in CFD domains, they're being coupled in. So it's always integrated, systemic. Maybe at this stage we put an electrical distribution definition because we want to make sure we can take the power from the PV roof or facade, use it. Maybe we want to see if a local fuel cell would be helpful. And at some stage we're really concerned about sickness. 240,000 houses in Scotland have mould growth. The moulds are all trying to live like us and they're all sporulating and giving off mycotoxins and children and elderly people are breathing this stuff. We want to make sure that doesn't happen. And we want to make sure our innovative approaches don't cause it to happen. So we resolve the model at some important part around about a thermal bridge. We look at the moisture accumulation there and we make sure this doesn't happen as we move towards an integrated solution. That was just to remind me to say that as soon as you get the constructional information in, you can go to photorealistic imaging, which is a very good dialogue with a client. And increasingly in future, we won't be putting in conventional HVAC systems. We'll be putting in hybrid renewable systems, like you know, renewable heating systems. And the benefit of this approach is it always works by giving an integrated view of, a, of performance. Another example from the ESPR, where all the different outputs that come at different times in the design process, not all just one thing, because you've got to put an effort and move along that path. But as you do that, you're capturing emissions. You're capturing typical or annual or 60-year performance data on energy use. You're capturing visual comfort for principal areas and principal times. You're capturing you know, thermal comfort, daylight, acoustic, annual totals. And as you then make changes, say, what happens if I do this? version two, version three, the tabs. And so you're having constructive dialogues with colleagues saying, yes, I can diminish the global warming potential, but I can only do that at the expense of something else over here or up there because everything's a trade-off in this world. So that's an integrated view of performance. I'm going to be talking just as I finish about how we might take all of this and put it in the hands of the design profession at no cost to them embed it within their process. However, it's also possible as an interim solution, as to we, to we get to that stage, to embed this power in very, very simple to use interfaces. What's behind the interfaces is as complex as I've just said, but nobody ever sees that. So here's four examples. EDEM, which is housing stock upgrades. So it's a model of the entire housing stock all pre-made, pre-simulated in the ESPR environment with every conceivable permutation of change put on top of it. So we've got a whole series of pre-constructed solutions for every combination that might be of interest for the Scottish housing stock. Insulation upgrades, renewable deployment, ground source heat pumps, and blah, blah. 
All a user has to do is come along and answer a couple of simple questions. What's your address? When was your house built? Have you had any upgrades recently? You know, have you cavity wall insulation? And that's sufficient for a search engine to go off, locate some preformed simulation results, and then give a very rich output, maybe in the form of an, uh, an energy performance certificate. 